the Free Market Foundation has launched its campaign for Home Rule. We speak to CEO David Ansara. Welcome, David. Good to be with you, Chris. David, please define Home Rule for us and tell us why it could be possible in South Africa. So this idea of Home Rule is very central to one of the key pillars and values of the Free Market Foundation. We're a classical liberal organization, so we believe in individual rights. Uh, and that includes private property rights, uh, freedom uh, to trade, so uh, a free market economy. We're, we're big on capitalism. We believe that that's a big driver of prosperity and growth in society. But one of the other pillars is the rule of law and constitutional government. And uh, part of that concept is the idea of political decentralization. So uh, we believe that... Uh, Political choices uh, are best when they are devolved down and out through society to the smallest political unit. The smallest political unit, obviously, is the individual themselves, uh, but also families, neighborhoods, towns, uh, broader communities, even cities and provinces, we believe should have a lot more authority and sovereignty over their own affairs. So this idea of home rule is really rooted in that tradition of limited government, of uh, political decentralization. Uh, and unfortunately, in South Africa, we have exactly the opposite of that at the moment. We have a high degree of political centralization, a uh, concentration of power in the hands of politicians and bureaucrats in Pretoria, making decisions on behalf of ordinary South Africans in uh, remote, distant parts of the country. And... Uh, you know, no matter how enlightened you are, uh, no matter how uh, well intentioned, you're never fully going to understand the particular local context and circumstances that affect uh, communities across this a uh, very diverse and plural society, right? So, and obviously, uh, there's some major political problems in South Africa at the moment that we diagnose as being uh, a consequence or a symptom of high degrees of political concentration. Uh, and the centralization that I mentioned. So if you think of load shedding, uh, we have one vertically integrated energy utility, ESCOM, state-owned. That's a concentration risk. When ESCOM breaks or is captured, uh, then that uh, acts as a, a choke point for the rest of the economy. Um, so uh, this, I think, also is a very good illustration of the ANC government's uh, view of the world, its ideology. Uh, at the business conference, you had uh, Anthea Jeffrey there from the Institute of Race Relations speaking about Countdown to Socialism, her, her latest book. And that really documents in meticulous detail this idea of the National Democratic Revolution, uh, which is the guiding philosophy and ideological framework of the ANC government, uh, which has at its root this idea of command and control. Uh, that the state is something that's not an independent, neutral set of institutions, but it's something to be captured for political purposes. And not just the state, but society uh, as a whole, uh, more broadly. Um, so this, these ideas of card redeployment, for example, uh, uh, black economic empowerment is a vehicle for this, uh, to politicize the economy. Um, and the, what we have is the political capture of, of so many spheres of our of, of our society and our economy. Um, so, you know, I often say that state capture is a, it's a feature, it's not a bug. Um, it's, it's baked into the political uh, program of, of the, the ANC government. It's not just some aberration like the, the Guptas coming to South Africa and, and hijacking this otherwise uh, noble uh, liberation movement. It's part of the philosophy of... Uh, of, of the ANC government. Uh, so this is a very good lens, I think, to think about politics in South Africa. Uh, I gave a speech last year called The Center Cannot Hold, and it's really a, the thesis of that speech was that the center is actually collapsing in South Africa, that all of the, the consequences of this high degree of centralization are starting to bear themselves out. And so uh, whether it's the collapse of infrastructure, the lack of availability of energy. You had John Andrews, also of the IRR, 
uh, on your show, you know, speaking about the uh, destruction of water infrastructure, um, ports and rail are also uh, massively dysfunctional, and that's uh, having a huge drag effect on on South Africa's economy. Um, and all of these, you can draw them back to failures at the centre. Um, and uh, you know, I think we're classical liberals uh, at the Free Market Foundation. We believe in a minimal state uh, that the government should protect basic rights uh, of individual citizens, but uh, it's really failing to do that. If you look at our elevated levels of violent crime, there are about 86 murders per day in South Africa. There are five reported rapes per day. Uh, That's only the ones that are reported. There must be uh, many more others that go unreported because victims uh, don't feel confident enough uh, to approach the police. Uh, So that is an illustration of the failure of the state to uphold its core mandate to citizens to enforce the law, to protect private property rights. The state is moving ahead with expropriation without compensation. National health insurance would also represent an assault on private health, uh, on private uh, property rights. So, you know, I think that we have this paradox in South Africa. The, the state's failing in its core functions, but more and more it's trying uh, to extend its reach into, into other areas. So we're trying to break that dynamic. We want to say home rule is much more important. We need far greater degrees of federalism in South Africa. We need capable local and provincial government authorities to start serving the constituencies that they represent and being more assertive in acquiring powers for themselves, for uh, their constituents, uh, and, and going against the, the status quo of how uh, things have traditionally been done in South Africa, where uh, there's a, a, a sort of a, a symbiotic uh, or a collaborative arrangement between uh, the different spheres of government. We want this idea of home rule uh, to be propagated. Uh, we've uh, authored this uh, report, uh, which we've uh, been disseminating through the Western Cape. We've been on this roadshow uh, from Nelson Mandela Bay uh, all the way down to, to Cape Town, where I'm speaking to you today. And so we've been going from town to town, uh, my colleague Martin from Starden and I, and uh, we, we've been in Plettenberg Bay, Neisner, George, Mossel Bay, uh, Hermanus. Uh, we met with, with uh, Alec Hogg there, which was, which was great. We had a good dinner with him. And then uh, we were also in Pal, and, and then we uh, had our formal launch event yesterday for the campaign for home. Uh, here in, in downtown Cape Town. David, now constitutionally it is possible, uh, but what would it involve practically? Um, if national government does not give that authority to the provinces and the municipalities for home rule, how do they take that authority? How do they make it happen? Well, I think uh, we can speak in abstract terms, but actually concretely it's already happening on the ground. The communities themselves are starting to to take over some of these functions. Um, so, you know, I think we also need to distinguish between devolution, uh, which are powers that are voluntarily granted and devolved down by the central government, and federalism, which actually recognizes that there are distinct spheres of authority. So, for example, uh, the mayor of George, uh, who we also met, uh, he doesn't necessarily have to write to the president to ask for permission uh, to enact the uh, policies that that his uh, democratically elected government in, in his municipality is responsible for. Um, so I think just going to your question, uh, when we were in Nelson Mandela Bay, uh, we uh, very unfortunately, as we were driving home from dinner one night, uh, we saw somebody on Beach Road being uh, being mugged and uh, dispossessed of his of his cell phone, um, and then the the culprits uh, ran away and disappeared into the night. And, you know, we were told that there was one provincial uh, or, or one SAPS uh, 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 patrol vehicle that, um, that, that monitors that beach road, and there's lots of similar violent crime incidents. Um, so what's actually happened in Nelson Mandela Bay, and your viewers will be very familiar with uh, some of the breakdown in services that have, have affected that uh, metro, um, is that communities are actually just getting together and... Uh, through voluntary free association are starting a, a community policing forums um, 
there is a mechanism called special ratings areas uh, where a, a, a suburb or a district can uh, collectively agree uh, to pay additional rates uh, over and above their their normal rates, and that entitles them to uh, to to procure private services like private security guards to install uh, security cameras and lighting. And so there's one park in Nelson Mandela Bay where they've done this. It was, um, you know, it, it was a, a bit of a crime hotspot until they did this, and they managed to to turn it around. So now the businesses in that area starting to benefit from uh, the uh, restoration of that uh, of that park. Um, and so this is a bit galling for many people because obviously they're paying their rates uh, and not getting the services that they're paying for. Um, uh, but, you know, in the absence of uh, proper service delivery in these areas, we're saying that uh, community groups, um, these kind of uh, business chambers, for example, I need to start uh, collaborating and using these mechanisms uh, to start to, to to take back power and to to try and improve their their own environments. You know, because uh, unfortunately, nobody's coming to save you from Pretoria. Um, uh, you will wait and wait uh, for for the help to arrive, and it will never come. So, uh, you know, the only choice is to to really do it yourself. And are, many people are pinning their hopes on a coalition government between the African National Congress and the Democratic Alliance, multi-party charter. Do you think that coalition will last? Well, the Free Market Foundation is a non-partisan organization. We're independent. So uh, our primary interest is to maximize uh, individual freedom in South Africa. So, uh, But we do pay very close attention to the political and policy process uh, because policy is an expression of the, the political uh, contest in South Africa. And uh, part of the, our, our reading is that, you know, we are picking up the sentiment. Uh, with, there's a lot of mixed messaging. Uh, on the one hand, the DA has expressed its commitment to the multi-party charter as the so-called anchor tenant of the uh, pre-electoral pact. Um, but then we also just hear a lot of discussion around this potential for a so-called grand coalition. And what what we're saying is, you know, to the DA is that it must recognize its bargaining power. Regardless of what it does, we're not necessarily going to prescribe uh, what it should do in terms of the coalition dynamics. It's a bit uh, beyond our scope. But, uh, you know, the EFF recognizes its bargaining power. If the ANC were significantly below 50%, say it was on around uh, 40%, and the EFF held the balance of power, it would come with very aggressive demands. The president must step down. And I think uh, Julius Malema was recently quoted saying that he would like Floyd Shavambu to be the finance minister. And I think we can all uh, imagine how badly that will go. Uh, the DA should ag- adopt a similarly aggressive posture, but from a different perspective. It should say, well, we understand our bargaining power and these are our demands. And the campaign for home rule is suggesting that those demands should be an aggressive uh, spreading of uh, political power and authority down to the provincial and local level. Uh, so the port in Cape Town needs to be managed by the city or the provincial authorities. Uh, the railways need to be managed by the air governments. Those should be some of the demands, and so, so uh, that sorry. that requires a bit of uh, a bit of chutzpah, a bit of uh, aggressive negotiating on behalf of the DA. You would like to then to see uh, them set federalist preconditions before going into a coalition. Is is that exactly. what you're saying, David? And 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 before going into the coalition, you know, our worry mm. is that perhaps there might be some. Uh, you know, impulse to some patriotic duty to save the the country from an EFF ANC coalition, and that's sort of where the discussion ends. Uh, no, it should be uh, much more assertive than that. And you know, I think uh, one of the things that we've picked up is often uh, officials in the province or in the various municipalities, so not the public representatives or political appointees, but they're often a lot more on the cautious side and you have legal advisors who say, oh, no, no, well, the, uh, you, you can't uh, 
take over this, uh, you know, the provincial powers bill, I think was, was a very good illustration. This was actually a pretty tame uh, proposal. Um, but Alan Wendy's legal advisors uh, advised him that this was unconstitutional. I mean, it was merely uh, just in this dynamic of sort of pleading for, for, for more powers rather than asserting more powers. So, you know, we're saying that the legal advice that the DA is getting maybe needs to change and needs to follow the political imperatives. And, um, you know, if uh, I mentioned EWC and NHI earlier, the ANC's legal advisors uh, seem to bend over backwards to justify what would be very clearly and blatantly unconstitutional policies. Uh, so, you know, clearly their lawyers are following uh, the political uh, political need there. And I think the DA should start to do the same instead of being uh, the nice guys. I mean, you know, the si- situation in South Africa is very serious. Uh, the state is failing all around us. And that's having real consequences uh, for the people of South Africa. And the people of the Western Cape are not immune from this. Uh, through our travels, we took in the beauty of the garden route and, and many of these well-functioning towns. And whilst some communities like in Nisner are really, they're mobilizing because uh, effluent is flowing into the estuary and potholes are springing up everywhere and they, they've really felt the consequences of, of uh, political instability and coalition politics. Um, but, you know, in other places like, for example, George, which is very well run, uh, we were told that the business community is pretty chilled, pretty relaxed. Um, so we're saying, you know, these trends, they're only going to accelerate regardless of the, the political outcome after 29th of May. You know, if there's this leftward lurch uh, towards the EFF and MK, uh, then that's obviously going to necessitate the need for local communities to protect themselves and, and to put as much distance as possible between themselves and Pretoria. But similarly... If there's an MPC coalition, that's going to be very unstable. It's going to be a potentially, uh, that coalition is going to be uh, coming together and then collapsing again, uh, similarly to what we've seen in Trani, for example. That, that's what we might see. And the capacity of the state has been so fundamentally broke that it's going to take a very, very long time to fix those problems. So regardless of the outcome of 29 May, uh, we're saying the federal push is going to be more and more urgent um so yeah i think that that's that's sort of the the scene setter uh, for this campaign um and you know i think uh we've we've been really amazed actually by the the, the warm reception that we've got uh, throughout our roadshow and we'll be producing quite a lot of content on our channel just showcasing some of the discussions that we've had thank you that was david and sarah of the free market foundation speaking to biz news after the launch of the campaign for Home Rule. Thank you, David. I'm Chris Stein.